people like me. You need people like me so you can point your f***ing fingers and say that's the bad guy. Okay, we'll start with this. It appears that Germany's own Nina Menke is going to be returning to action this weekend opposite the ring Italy's own Angela Canizzaro. Veteran journey woman from that region of the world. And what is being billed as a featherweight contest. Featherweight, that's where Amanda Serrano reigns as that division's undisputed champion. And that's where there are a good number of unbeaten up-and-comers, very talented young fighters. Fighters like Karis Ardingstall from the United Kingdom, who's going to be in action this weekend. Raven Chapman as well. Australia's own Sky Nicholson, Germany. His own Sophia Leash and Sarah Liegman. Featherweight's got talent. A lot of it. There's a large concentration of very talented up-and-comers in the women's featherweight division. Nina Menke. A veteran of 18 professional contests, only 30 years old, fights out of the southpaw stance. Yeah, she's going to be facing a southpaw like herself in oh. Angela Canizaro, 46 years old, having lost six of her last six fights. Needless to say, with that kind of record, you know what kind of fight this is. Sir, keep busy fight, tick over fight. Foregone conclusion fight, really. Any fighter with an iota of boxing ability, talent, and skill stands a very good chance of beating Angela Canizaro. But because Angela's a southpaw... I don't think Nina's fighting a southpaw for no reason. It just so happens that two of those unbeaten up-and-comers I just mentioned, they happen to be southpaws like Nina's a southpaw, like Angela is a southpaw, Karis Artingstall and Sky Nicholson. They're southpaws too. Sarah Liegman is as well. That makes Three. So is it possible the reason that Nina Menke is facing another southpaw like herself, a journey woman, in a takeover fight, is it possible that the reason Nina's facing a southpaw is because she means to fight one of those aforementioned southpaws like a Karis Artingstall or a Sarah Liegman? Sky Nicholson. Is that the rhyme and the reason behind this fight? Currently, Nina Menke is coming off of three consecutive victories, three consecutive wins after having dropped a decision last year to Denmark's own Sarah Mafood the then IBF featherweight champion. Nina's won three fights in a row since then. Her handlers have done a very good job of keeping her busy this past calendar year. She fought four times, four times last year. This will be her first fight this year. And there's not much reason to fight a fighter like Angela Canizaro, who sports a professional record of six wins with 18 losses in one draw. There's not much reason to fight a fighter like that with a record like that, outside of just keeping busy for Nina, who's only ever really lost to good fighters and solid fighters, some of the best, like Katie Taylor, Sarah Mafood. There's certainly nothing to gain for Nina, fighting a fighter like Angela Canizaro, nope. outside of just being able to keep busy and get some rounds in the bank. But that she's fighting a southpaw, that is interesting, because maybe this is a stay busy fight en route to a fight with a better southpaw. Nina Menke herself has a respectable pro record, 15 wins with three losses, no draws, three knockouts having only ever been knocked knocked out once, once, just once in 18 professional contests. That was the Katie Taylor fight. Many, many years ago, Nina Menke is a solid and serviceable fighter in the featherweight division. The ideal opponent for a Karis Artingstall, a Sophia Leash, a Sarah Liegman, a Sky Nicholson, a Raven Chapman. She's the ideal opponent for fighters like that, unbeaten up-and-comers that are looking to make a name for themselves, climbing up those ranks. There's not much chance of Nina prying all the belts away from Amanda Serrano. No, Amanda would stop her. She'd stop Nina Menke. Menke, but opposite the ring, more green fighters. Fighters that are less experienced. Nina Menke can give those kinds of fighters that to which they have to work around. And I do get the sense that that's more or less what this is. A prelude to a fight between Nina and one of them. One of those unbeaten up-and-comers in the women's featherweight division. That's what I think this is. I won't begrudge her keeping busy, even if it is with a journey woman. And what is a foregone conclusion fight, at least she's keeping busy and keeping the tools sharp. Her not being with a major promotional outfit, resources are scarce. They're doing what they can. Set to go down this weekend in Hamburg, Germany. Nina Menke to win. Nina on points. Nina not being the biggest puncher. That's the logical pick.
In men's super bantamweight news, I'm sure most of you have heard already per a tweet from Mike Kopinger via his sources that Naoya Inoue suffered an injury in training and his May 7th fight in Japan versus Stefan Fulton for the unified 122-pound championship has been postponed. Sources tell ESPN, no new date at this moment, story coming. I can't even begin. You know, my heart sank to my toes when I read that. My heart sank to my toes. There's a lot of good fights on the schedule, a lot of decent fights, a lot of solid fights, but this fight, this fight fight was one of my favorite among them. One of the very best fights on the schedule. The silver lining is that Stefan Fulton himself took to social media and allayed everyone's fears by simply stating, we've got a date, relax, it's still happening. There are not a lot of fights quite as special as this one is. Stefan Fulton is doing what he's got to do to participate in the biggest fight that he can have anywhere at or around these weights. Against a monster. A man that has been a monster in three divisions so far, and now he's shooting for four. Stefan didn't shy away from the challenge. He chose to meet it head on. Unbeaten fighter versus unbeaten fighter. Beast from the east versus the best from the west. Part of me is still disappointed that even though the fight might still happen, it won't happen on the original schedule because I was very much looking forward to this fight, more so than most of what's already on schedule. This weekend's fight, this weekend's pay-per-view included. The Benavidez versus Plant fight, that fight that's long overdue. This fight between Stefan and Naoya is a cut above that fight. This is a way better fight. Benavidez is also that good. I think that in a way Fulton is just a little bit better. But what are we basing it off? Well, for starters, now yeah, you know, is a consensus top five pound for pound fighter in the sport, whereas neither Caleb Plant or David Benavidez are ranked as such, thought of as such. Stefan Fulton, he's an unbeaten unified champion. Neither Caleb Plant or David Benavidez. They're are. not unified champions now. They never were. Stefan Fulton versus Naoya Inoue is unbeaten fighter versus unbeaten fighter. Caleb Plant already got beat over a year ago when Canelo Alvarez knocked him out. Did you miss it? And I'm not shitting on this fight. I'm just saying y'all shitting on other fights to tell us the real hardcores. Real hardcores? What makes you a real hardcore when you're turning your nose up at Naoya Inoue's quality of competition? How does that work? That y'all smarter than us. That these dudes... This is a better fight, more skill fight. Tell me how, break it down how. Well, Inui versus Fulton features at least one pound for pound fighter, a consensus pound for pound fighter. And the pound for pound is all about skill. That's literally what that list is supposed to be, a skills assessment. And neither Caleb Plant or David Benavidez are ranked as pound for pound fighters like Naoya Inoue. How this man fighting a bunch of fucking nobodies that nobody wants to give a motherfucking fuck about. But people give a fuck about Kyron Davis, Ronald Ellis. They give a fuck about those guys. They give a fuck about an over-the-hill David Lemieux. Who gives a fuck about those guys? Who gives a fuck, a flying flamingo-shaped fuck about Anthony Durrell? Who in the history of man fucking kind has ever given one iota of a fuck? Who gives a fuck about Durrell? I want y'all to, to tell me. You already said you don't watch the I'm lower just divisions saying, and ask who the fuck don't watch it. That's your motherfucking excuse to try to win the oh, argument. Oh, oh. Well, your excuse to try and win the argument is that nobody gives a fuck about the guys he knew he fought because people give a fuck about the guys David Benavidez fought. No, they don't. I watch no, one eighteen. I watch one fifteen. Fuck y'all talking about. Y'all motherfuckers ain't bro, never watched Big Dog Chini. Fuck out of here. Inui versus Fulton is a special fight for more reasons than one. More special, a lot more special than Benavidez versus Plant, which by all rights should have happened already. Yeah. Because it's an in-house fight between two non-champions for an interim title, a trinket. Whereas with Inui and Fulton, we didn't even know if we were going to get this fight because initial reports seemed to indicate that Stefan was going to move up to featherweight to box Brandon Figueroa for a second time. Stefan saw the opportunity to stay put and defend his titles against the monster, the guy that he said he wanted to fight. When he circled back and he did that, it was a pleasant surprise that was received well by everyone. Boxing community is normally divided on a lot of issues, but when it came to this and when it came to this fight, everybody celebrated that news. It was good news to everybody. People that can't agree on anything agreed.
That was good news. But you're trying to tell me that Benavidez versus Plant is equal to or better than in terms of quality and value for money? We weren't going to have to pay pay-per-view prices for this fight. Was going to be boxing for breakfast by way of ESPN+. Benavidez versus Plant is a fight that was over-marinated. Over-marinated for so long that Caleb Plant ended up boxing someone else. He ended up boxing Canelo Alvarez, who stopped him over a year ago. The most that David can do now is do the same. Don't pretend that Benavidez versus Plant has the same air of intrigue that Inui versus Fulton has, because it doesn't. We've seen Caleb stopped before, so it's conceivable that he could get stopped again. Unless I'm mistaken, that's how the odds makers have it. Don't the bookies have David Benavidez as the favorite going into this thing? It's not the same caliber of fight. These two fighters are not the same caliber of fighters that Stefan Fulton and Naoya Inoue are. Naoya Inoue is a pound-for-pound guy. Stefan Fulton's a unified champion, an unbeaten one, at the peak of his powers. In what way is David Benavidez waiting good up until Canelo knocks the guy out? In what way are those two things the same? They're not. That's just more Western arrogance and xenophobia. That's all it is. Benavidez versus Plant isn't as good a fight as Inui versus Fulton, and I can only hope that they reschedule this thing in a timely fashion, because I was really excited for this fight. I'm not so excited for this weekend's fight with David and Caleb. Even if I do happen to watch it, it's not as good a fight. And it's as simple as that. And finally, in men's heavyweight news, I'm sure you've all heard by now that Tyson Fury versus Oleksandr Usyk is not happening on April 29th, according to Usyk's manager, Igis Klimas, who is now declared. Klimas said, no matter how much Usyk compromised, he was pushed for more. He added that they hope for Usyk to return in a mandatory defense in June or July. Steve Kim broke the story, and I got the chance to have Steve here on the channel last night in the late night boxing talks. We discussed the particulars, the varying grotesqueries of what these negotiations have been, who's to blame, how it looks, and where it goes. From here, Oleksandr Yusik's promoter, Alex Krasiuk on Tyson Fury stated, If I started telling you the things he wanted, 15 minutes is not enough. There was a list of things he wanted which were absolutely unacceptable. Complete disrespect to the unified and former undisputed champion. Yeah, I think it's been disrespectful. From the beginning, the Usyk people weren't hard to work with. They agreed to their end of the deal over there in Saudi Arabia before the Fury people. It was the Fury people, per usual, raising issues that supposedly the Saudis wouldn't be able to construct the location for the match on time by the April 29th deadline. Though if ensuring that the fight happens on the 29th of next month were that important to you, it'd be done by now. And it's not. It's been the Tyson Fury people altering the terms of engagement and certain deal points. They've been the ones dragging this out. While Frank Warren insists that the Tyson Fury versus Oleksandr Yusik fight is not off as far as he's confirmed, he said he convinced Fury to U-turn and accept the rematch clause, but a dispute then emerged over the rematch split. We want the fight. Why can't it be overcome? Because your fight is a fucking idiot. Frank's declaring that Tyson Fury is willing to accept the rematch clause deal for the Oleksandr Usyk fight, which matches the one Usyk got versus Anthony Joshua. Eddie Hearn previously revealed their rematch was a 50-50 purse split as Usyk won the first fight. So I guess what this means is that should Oleksandr win the first fight with Tyson Fury, he'll get half the pot in the rematch. Yeah, that's if there even is a first fight. I'm not optimistic. When the Usyk people say that they feel Usyk has been disrespected by Tyson Fury and how this fight has been so negotiated, I can't help but agree with them. Usyk agreed to his end of the deal in Saudi Arabia, where the fight would have got him a lot more money than what it might get him in the UK. And it's you guys. You're the ones that fucked that up. You're the ones that moved the fight so you could take it to the UK and then lowball the guy. You've already costed him millions by moving the fight from Saudi over to the UK and you don't even offer the guy a decent split? They offered him 70-30. Even worse is that he accepted it. He was willing to play ball, but it seems that the terms of engagement for a second fight for a rematch, that then became an issue because Tyson Fury stated he don't want no rematch clause in the fight. And you have to pay attention to the details in a situation like this. That's where the devil is. The devil's in the details. Last week, with only approximately six weeks to go, Tyson Fury comes out and says, let's scrap the rematch clauses. The Usyk people didn't like this. Likely because they hope to make in a rematch what they're not making in the first fight. And with only six weeks to go, if these were the terms of engagement up until recently, with just 
six weeks to go. Why would Tyson Fury all of a sudden change the terms of engagement? If that's what the terms were up until last week with just six weeks to go, why do you now want to alter them? Are you willfully being difficult? It looks that way to a lot of people because the Usyk people, that team, they don't normally have this many issues negotiating a fight. They're relatively easy people to have to work with and that there's no other promotional outfit, no other platform that Frank has to work with in order to do this fight. It should have been a relatively easy fight to make and it isn't. It never is with Tyson Fury. I and mean, that's what it is. The Usyk people like their chances enough against Tyson Fury that they're willing to concede a 70-30 split in Tyson Fury's favor so long as they get a better split in the rematch. That's fair. Frank Warren said as much. Frank Warren who said, you know why they want the rematch clause? Because it's two paydays. Where are they gonna earn the type of money they earn fighting Tyson twice? Not versus Philippe Pergovic, Joe Joyce, or Daniel Dubois. That's why they want it. It's pretty fucking obvious why they want it, Frank. I could have told you that's why they want it. It's because you've offered them a paltry split for the first fight, so they hope to make more money in the second fight. But it's because they actually believe there's going to be a second fight. They like their chances against your fighter. They like them enough that they're willing to agree to your 70-30 split. And as soon as they did, as soon as they agreed to it, here comes Tyson Fury once again, altering the terms of engagement with just six weeks to go. Oh, now you want to take the rematch clauses out of it. This guy, he just wants to make this as difficult as possible and waste everybody's time. Where does dealing with him compare to dealing with Anthony Joshua? You mentioned there about... Nightmare. Nightmare. Expand on that. How is it different? Obviously, we saw two fights in one instance and we're yet to see the other fight, but... Listen, uh, with Eddie... I mean, we had five fights together. I never had a tro any trouble dealing with, with Mushroom. Uh, according to my experience, I, I, I need to give a big credit to Mushroom and to Eddie and to Frank. Because uh, they were, I enjoy uh, watching how they work. I like it. Um, the negotiations never last uh, that long. It's very easy. We are not uh, wasting each other's time. It's uh, it's uh, proper treating each other. With with AJ, uh, it wasn't really complicated. Where does dealing with him compare to dealing with Anthony Joshua? You mentioned there about nightmare. So Alexander Krasiuk describes working with Tyson Fury, the stark contrast between doing a fight with Anthony Joshua and doing a fight with Tyson Fury. In truth, these assurances from Frank Warren that the fight can still happen provide no assurances at all. That's just him trying to get in front of this thing in order to save face, because if the fight ultimately does collapse, He'll take the heat for it. Him and Tyson Fury. Anthony Joshua was able to do a fight with the same Usyk two times. No issues. No issues according to Team Usyk. With Fury. With Fury. It's a fucking nightmare.